Good afternoon. I want to thank everybody that's tuning in either live or later when you watch the rebroadcast of our community conversations shaping our shores. We very much appreciate your interest in our county. The purpose of this event is to talk about the significance of shaping our shores, especially for the Berkeley District. Uh, even during these very challenging times, we want to make sure that we are keeping James City County residents informed about what's going on on local government. Those viewing us live can submit questions via Facebook Live or email. Community.meetings at jamescitycountyva.gov. Again, you can either submit questions via Facebook Live or email. And if you are seeing this after it's been done live, you can also get some information about where you can email us uh, and we'll be happy to answer questions later on as well. An overview of our program is going to be uh, Parks and Rec, Shaping Our Shores Master Plan by Carla Brittle, Parks and Recreation Center's Administrator. I am really excited about Shaping Our Shores because all of these parks fall in the Berkeley District. And so I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of all the work that the Parks and Rec Department has done and the support that you, the citizens, have given this initiative. So we have a lot of exciting things planned, and Carla has been in there from the get-go, and so she'll be able to really let us know what's going on. We'll also get an update on our CARES Act funding by Sharon Day, Financial and Management Service Director, and also joining us here is County Administrator Scott Stevens, Parks Administrator Alistair Perkinson, and Communications Manager Latara Rouse, and Renee, Renee Dahlman, Public Information Officer. We'll also have an opportunity, like I said earlier, for questions and answers. And so again, you can do those by Facebook Live or email. And I'm going to repeat it one more time, community.meetings at jamescitycountyva.gov. And with that, I'm going to turn it over for the overview of Shaping Our Shores to Carla. Carla, thanks so much for being here and for the information you're about to give. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here um, to present the newly adopted Shaping Our Shores Master Plan. This updated plan represents over a year and a half of work from the design phase to final approval, and it's a direct result of feedback from our citizens. The Shaping Our Shores Master Plan was originally created in 2009 to guide the revitalization of future amenities at our three waterfront park facilities to include the Chickahominy Riverfront Park, the James City County Marina, and the Jamestown Beach Event Park. At the time of the original plan, two of the parks were newly acquired from private operators. The close proximity of the three parks led to their inclusion into one waterfront master plan to ensure future amenities were placed at the appropriate location and to avoid duplication of facilities within the three parks. For your reference, the James City County Marina and the Jamestown Beach Event Park are located at the end of Jamestown Road prior to the Surrey Ferry Dock, and Chickahominy Riverfront Park is located on Route 5 prior to the bridge that leads to Charles City. The Shaping Our Shores Master Plan shows a broad overview of the amenities that could be located in each park. Their exact location is subject to change, and there is no time frame for when they will be built. The plan also remains unfunded until the Board of Supervisors includes specific projects in the county's capital improvement project budget. The average shelf life of a master plan is traditionally 10 years, unless no development has occurred in the park. Since the original Shaping Our Shores master plan, multiple upgrades and amenities have been added to each park. There have also been new environmental regulations that the old plan did not address. A final reason to update the plan was to check in with citizens and current park users to see if needs have changed. I mentioned that new amenities have been added to all three parks since 2009, and these trends highlight their impact on attendance and revenue. Broadly looking at these numbers, it is apparent that the parks continue to grow in popularity and that their usage has changed over the years. The trend that stands out the most is the attendance more than doubling at the James City County Marina. This is due to the addition of Billsburg Brewery and their ongoing events, which doesn't even appear in the original master plan. The updating of this master plan was conducted totally in-house, 
with the interdepartmental team of employees was created in 2018. Members include Alex Holloway and Alistair Perkinson from Parks and Recreation, Chris Johnson and Laura Messer from the Office of Economic Development, Daryl Cook and Sean Gordon from General Services, Jose Ribeiro from Planning, and Mike Bragakis from the James City Service Authority. The update included a public input campaign complete with two meetings and several survey collections. The final plan was presented to the Board of Supervisors at the July 14th meeting where it was approved and adopted. At this time, I'd like to show you the three individual park maps to highlight what's included in each. The first one is Chickahominy Riverfront Park. As I mentioned previously, this park is located on Route 5 just prior to the bridge to Charles City, right here. This park currently has multiple amenities to include camping, a pool and a splash pad, a boat ramp, a rowing facility. So this master plan has the least changes. What was added is a new relocated camp store. Here's the entrance right here, new camp store. Camp store will have additional camping amenities to include a propane filling station and a recreational um, environmental education room. Additional fishing piers are shown on this map and the addition of laundry rooms um, on new bathhouses, several new bathhouses proposed around with laundry facilities, which would be new. A second rowing building has also been added due to the growth in the sport and the long-term RV boat storage has been relocated to the front corner of the park to allow for expansion. Lastly, the location of a possible future James City Service Authority water treatment plant has been added. While it is not known if the plan will, plant will ever be built, the team did not locate any amenities in its footprint. James City County Marina is located on Jamestown Road across from the Jamestown Settlement. Of the three parks, this one has the most changes to the original master plan. The previous plan showed items located in the floodplain and in the resource protection area, and they had to be removed. Additionally, it contained retail shops, a hotel, and condos that were not endorsed by the Board of Supervisors. Changes for this park include relocating the marina store, an office, um, and the dry dock storage area out of the floodplains. Um, adding additional short-term boat trailer parking in this area, relocating the long-term boat storage that was previously here um, from this site, moving it over across the street to Jamestown Beach Event Park due to lack of space, the addition of a second entrance into the park and a new parking lot, a semi-permanent event tent, relocation of the proposed restaurant out of the floodplain, and a relocation of the boat ramp and fuel dock to this location. Last up is the Jamestown Beach Event Park, which is located across Jamestown Road from the marina and directly before the ferry dock. Development of this park is severely limited by identified archeological and historical sites and the restrictive covenants of the two grants that were used to purchase the property in 2007. A lot of development work has occurred at this park since the original plan. With the assistance of three grants, the very popular Jamestown Beach was added. To complement this work, the following items are included for future development. A realignment of the concert venue with restrooms, realignment of the park entrance along Jamestown Road, to intersect with the road leading to the marina. Right here, align those two. Closing the section of Green Springs Road that runs in front of the park, section of Green Springs Road that runs right now along here and has sharp turns, and aligning it to meet Jamestown Road. So it will come down and meet Jamestown Road here for a turn. Addition of, the, of an event tent for use with the Ambler House, right there. Addition of long-term boat storage to support the marina, and the addition of a public-private running center to support community racing and events. This newly approved plan will now be used to guide the long-term development for each park. 
As I stated earlier, the plan remains unfunded until the board includes specific projects in the county's capital improvement project budget. Therefore, this plan will be reviewed annually prior to the submission of the Parks and Recreation budget for selection of items to be presented to the board for funding consideration. And that concludes that presentation. Thank you. Uh, I apologize. I forgot to introduce myself, even though there was a note here that said, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Ruth Larson, and I am the supervisor on the Board of Supervisors that reps, represents the Berkeley District. And I am entering my uh, first, this is my first year of my second term uh, representing the Berkeley District, and so I'm proud to do so, and uh, please reach out to me at any time. My contact information is on the James City County website, uh, but it's ruth.larson at jamescitycounty.ba.gov. So I hate to put you on the spot, Carla, but I'm going to put you on the spot if I could for just a minute, just because I know that I use our trails a lot. And so it seems as though there's been an increased use, especially since March, um, when people have not been able to do a whole lot. So are you, are you all experiencing that as well? And have you, you've obviously been able to keep up with it because our parks look beautiful. But do you have any idea how much increase we've seen at our different um, parks? There is definitely an increase in um, park usage during the, the shutdown of COVID when all of our, uh, the rec center and different facilities and programs were, were canceled, one thing that remained open were the parks. And so we did reassign staff um, to work in the parks to keep up with the workload in terms of trash collection, to maintain the trails, to keep a clean operating for our citizens. There's been a dramatic use in trail usage. Just I, me personally, I use three of them all the time on a mm -hmm. daily basis. And such a large increase. I don't have actual um, trail counter information yeah, that's with me, fine, but, but it, it's definitely, um, definitely increased in terms of families. And it's the, the people that are using the trails have changed also, I think, since COVID. You see entire families out now where you used mm -hmm. to see, you know, individuals walking their dogs or people getting exercise. And now it's entire multi-generational families, um, you know, people walking babies and things. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're definitely getting a lot more usage. Yeah, that's great. I usually use the one near Jamestown High School. Uh, or the trail out um, by the Sandy Warner Stadium, the Wist Warhill, Warhill Trail. That's yes. a tough trail. It is tough. <laughs> yeah, uh, lots, lots of hills. It is. Um, but and I will say that people are very polite about stepping aside or social distancing. That's not been an issue at all. But you all do such a great job keeping our parks in such great shape, and I'm really appreciative of that. So thank you, and thank you for a great presentation. So and sorry to put you on the spot, but. Thanks. So at that, I'm going to turn it over to County Administrator Scott Stevens, and you're going to do an overview of our budget and also where we are with CARES Act funding. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you, Ms. Larson. I am going to do a short introduction and then turn it over to our Financial Management Services Director for the real details. That's not how this normally works for me. Okay. Uh, but I do want to well, welcome folks that are paying attention, that are watching live, and those that miss us later, please send in your questions. We're happy to respond and try to answer questions you may have about these or any other topics within your county government. I, I will share that COVID-19 has had an impact on most local government finances, and uh, ours is no different. Our, our budget or fiscal year runs just July 1st through June 30th of each year. And so COVID really had an impact on the last quarter of our fiscal year 2020. Uh, and it significantly reduced our FY21 budget or current year that was adopted by the Board of Supervisors in June. Just with the uncertainty and the concern, uh, our adopted budget is significantly less than our, our previous year's budget. Again, that all, by almost $16 million. So again, that's a significant number that our departments have had to adjust to and the anticipated loss of revenue will have an impact within our hiring, maintenance, and capital projects for the county. We won't have much to share today on our current budget year as revenues lag, meaning uh, the sales tax that was generated in July, we won't really know the outcome of that until the September timeframe. So we'll update the board as we go through the fall. But we do have good information to share with you today concerning our last year's budget, our FY20 budget. Business and tourism shut down again in the last quarter and early on, your staff or county staff were thinking about the impact on county finances and how we would weather the loss of revenue that was likely to happen because of these business closings. 
Uh, we immediately uh, implemented a hiring freeze within our department, instructed departments to stop spending on non-essential items. Purchase above $5,000 had to be approved by our FMS director, above $10,000 by our FMS director and myself. We suspended our capital improvement projects that had not begun work, and we evaluated all other expenditures to see what we could stop or delay in an effort to save money and make sure that our year ended on a positive note. Um, in some areas, we really saved money, um, and in others, we have only delayed the expenditure. For example, if we delayed hiring a staff person, we've actually saved that salary cost until we make the hire in a future time. Conversely, if we stop the replacement on a roof for one of our buildings, we have merely delayed that expenditure, and at some point we will have the expense of replacing or repairing that roof. And so we'll have more conversations with our Board of Supervisors as we go through the year. The federal government did provide CARES Act funding to help localities respond to the financial impact caused by COVID-19. James City County has received $13,352,674 in CARES Act money since March to help with our COVID-19 response. This money cannot be used to replace lost revenues, but can help in many other ways to meet the needs of our community. With that short summary, I would like to turn the discussion over to Ms. Sharon Day, our Financial and Management Services Director, to provide an overview of how we ended last year or fiscal year 20 and to let you know the latest items we intend to support using CARES Act funding. So, Ms. Day. Thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction and thank you for the opportunity to provide more detailed um, update on some of the specifics to our most recently concluded fiscal year. Uh, as Mr. Stevens mentioned, our fiscal year, uh, fiscal year 20 just ended on June 30th, uh, 2020. And for purposes of the presentation today, uh, the slides are going to compare our budgeted numbers to our actual estimated figures. Um, however, some of my comments are going to focus on the last quarter of the year because I think that is of particular importance um, so we can really get an idea of the impacts that we've seen in our community specifically related to COVID. I also wanted to note, um, just for ease of going through the, the presentation, I will use whole numbers um, for purposes of talking through my comments. And again, the next couple slides are really going to focus on our last fiscal year, and I will touch on briefly the current fiscal year as well, as well as provide uh, an update to our, our CARES funding. Overall, um, comparing the budget to the actual numbers, we are projected to have a revenue shortfall of approximately $3.7 million. I wanted to go, go over some of the more significant variances by category, starting with our general property taxes. Um, this, of course, is the main revenue source for the county. This includes our real estate property taxes as well as our personal property taxes. And as you can see, uh, we are estimated to actually come uh, above budget in that area by about $1 million. And the reason for that is a new assessment uh, that we received in fiscal year 20 that was not included in the budget at that time because we weren't, we weren't um, certain about the timing of it. And that's for the Skiffs Creek switching station, um, which was a Dominion Power property. In the local taxes section, this is the area that we're really focused in on. Uh, this area we commonly refer to as our excise taxes category, and it includes items that are more consumer driven, such as our sales taxes, our historic triangle additional 1% sales tax, our meals tax, and our lodging tax. And this is the area where we're really seeing the more significant impact as a result of COVID and just a lack of, of the tourism in our area. Specifically for local sales tax, um, and again, I want to talk a little bit about the last quarter of the year, comparing um, the March-June timeframe this year compared to last year instead of comparing it to budget. When we look at those numbers in this area, we saw a decline for local sales tax of about 39%. It was almost 40% down, and that equated to about $1.1 million. For the historic triangle tax, that additional 1% tax, we saw a reduction of 75%, or about $1.4 million, when we compare that same time period to last year. 
For both of these areas, I did want to mention that we are seeing improvements, um, very positive trend. As Mr. Stevens mentioned earlier in his remarks, um, this area actually lags in receipt by two months. So in August, we just saw the figures for June. And for June this year compared to June last year, we are almost identical in the receipt, which has been very positive trend because we were tracking about 40% down. Lots of assumptions um, can go behind the reasoning for that. Um, I know one of the theories is that people perhaps were holding off on purchases um, as a result of COVID and just the uncertainty that was brought with that, maybe in terms of their employment or their own household needs and concerns. And perhaps consumer confidence has begun to go up. We also know that as we entered phases two and three, the retail establish establishments also began to reopen in June. And so therefore there are more places to shop. For meals tax, um, that category we experienced an 84% reduction or about $1.6 million just between March and the June timeframe compared to, to last year. Lodging tax was down about 74% or about $865,000. And the reason it's important to, to talk about that is when you look at the budget to actual, it's down about 2.6 million, but that's looking at the year as a whole. And up until COVID, until the March timeframe, we were trending very far ahead of budget. We were having a good year. Um, and as a result of COVID, we really took a nosedive particularly in those areas. And so even though we're seeing double digit increases between 75, 85%, the fact that we are tracking above for the other nine months or so of the year really help offset the impact of that. For licenses, permits, and fees, um, again, this area isn't quite as significant in terms of overall dollars, and it's also not tied directly to tourism, but we are seeing a decline in that area as well. Um, specifically in our business licenses area, that collection is based on gross receipts um, from sales for the businesses. Most of the businesses are filing timely. However, they aren't necessarily remitting payment or remitting full payment. So that has caused us to shift into more of a collection mode. And most likely businesses will pay, but they'll pay late, meaning we'll see perhaps an increase this year for people paying in 21 for sale for business licenses for last year. We also experienced a decline in permit activity, building permits specifically, and also stormwater permit revenues. Over on the state and federal category, the majority of that is made up of the Personal Property Tax Relief Act, which is a block grant we received from the state. We didn't have any impact from that. We also received funding from the state for our constitutional officers. We did not have a decline in that category other than for any impact on turnover or the hiring freeze. If we have a position in those offices and a hiring freeze is in place, we don't have the expense, but we also don't receive the reimbursement from the state. What we did see there is an increase in the sales tax for education, which is interesting um, because as I mentioned previously, our sales tax locally was down quite a bit. However, the basis for those taxes is different. The local sales tax is based on local sales here, here in our area, whereas the sales tax for education is a statewide number that is based on overall sales in the state. And so because that allocation is different, we're seeing different results. Overall for the year, we saw an increase of 324,000. Every month was up except for the month of April. And then in the last category in charges for services, you can see there we were down about $1.8 million. Most of that was due to recycling, uh, where we saw a decrease in the program revenue of about $600,000. That is an area, however, that also has a decrease in the expenditures. Those two are program driven and they go hand in hand. Same thing with our parks and recreation programs. We had a decline of about $793,000 from program revenue. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier tonight, a lot of those programs were suspended. And so we also had a decrease in the expenditure side. 
Moving on to the expenditure category, I did want to mention our actual category includes both actual expenditures as well as commitments that we had at year end. For example, any outstanding contracts or purchase orders that we have. Overall, here again, as a result of some of the efforts that were put into place earlier in the year as a result of COVID, we are expected to come under budget by about $9.7 million. As you know, again, a lot of restrictions were put into place and those restrictions continue. Listed on this slide are the overall savings by department, just for your information purposes. But in general, the bulk of that $9.7 million breaks down to about $2.1 million in personnel savings, mainly driven by turnover, uh, vacancies, the hiring freeze that was in place, and also some furloughs to our hourly employees as a result of program suspensions and also office closures. Our non-personnel savings was about $7.5 million. And what we saw there across the board were the suspension of our travel and training programs, utilities, fuel, building improvements and maintenance, and delaying buying new furniture, equipment, and vehicles, both new and replacement items. We suspended a few of our county programs for our employees that included areas such as our tuition assistance program and also our employee recognition events after COVID hit us. General services had a savings from recycling. As I mentioned earlier, we had a revenue shortfall, but we also had expenditure savings of about half a million dollars. And then Parks and Rec had savings of about $870,000, which again helped to offset the revenue shortfall. In the contributions and transfers category, working with our school division, the schools were able to return unused capital project funds of $2.4 million. Again, this did not result in the delay or elimination of any projects, although we do have that as well. This was actually funds that were returned to the county for completed projects and not requested for a future project at this time, again, due to COVID. Our county administrator also used very little of his contingency funding in fiscal year 20, and we received a refund from the juvenile detention center for our share of their year in surplus. Basically, the juvenile detention center did have a surplus and they allocated those funds and returned those to the member localities due to the COVID environment. So in summary, we had a revenue, projected revenue shortfall of about $3.7 million, expenditure savings of about 9.7 million. And the result of that would be a projected year in surplus of roughly $6 million. It is important to note of that $6 million, about 2.4 of that was committed during the fiscal year 2021 capital improvement budget process, where we did have a few vital CIP projects that survived the COVID reductions, mainly some general services critical maintenance projects, as well as a few public safety equipment replacements. For fiscal year 21, the current fiscal year, which just began in July, as the county administrator has mentioned, most of our revenue up to this point is really for last fiscal year. So again, our revenue for sales tax and meals and lodging, those all lag at least one month, if not two months. We are currently, of course, in the month of August, which means we're collecting some of our taxes for July. I will say in, in conversations with our treasurer, and you may have read that the U.S. Postal Service is struggling with the delivery of mail, we are seeing that. Um, we are seeing about a two-week delay. And so again, initially the numbers may look bad, but they may get better as we catch up in processing the mail and as that mail is delivered to us. On the expenditure side, again, the same restrictions that we had initiated back in the March timeframe continue today. Um, we continue to scrutinize and make sure that we're only spending for essential services. And I think it's also important to note that we're already operating with a reduced budget. The adopted budget for this fiscal year was reduced about 10% as a result of COVID. 
We are still in what we call accrual mode, which again, most of the bills we're paying right now, other than payroll, are still for last fiscal year. So we don't have a whole lot of new information other than what we see on a daily basis um, and just making sure we don't see anything out of the ordinary. We do intend to start briefing the board on a monthly basis, probably starting in September. Um, by September, we will have the July and August information on the revenue side. And in September, we start paying more bills that are for this fiscal year, and we'll have a better sense of how we're trending. Switching over um, to an update on the CARES Act, um, again, the level of funding, we did receive our first allocation back in June, $6.7 million, which was received in full in advance from the state. Back in August, um, earlier this month, we received our second allocation of $6.7 million uh, after we completed a required survey regarding the use of those funds. And again, in total, we've received about $13.4 million. And again, the criteria for spending those dollars, it has to be a direct result of COVID. It cannot be an expenditure that's already part of our approved budget. The expense has to be incurred between the March 1st, December 30th, 2020 timeframe, and it cannot, at least at this time, be used for any revenue loss or replacement. I did provide a briefing uh, to the board uh, back in July regarding the detailed uses of the CARES funding to date. Tonight, I wanted to focus on a few more recent developments since that last update. Specifically, uh, nonprofit COVID assistance. Uh, we have devised a funding application for nonprofits to apply for CARES funding. It's now available on the county's website, and those applications are due to the county on September the 4th. We've also had a lot of detailed discussion, uh, both with the county and schools, regarding providing child care assistance to employees as well as the community. That process is now well underway, and detailed information is expected to be released sometime later this week. We have estimates on broadband improvements. Um, those estimates have been received, and that project is moving forward as well. And also in August, the board approved continuing to absorb the credit card fees for payments received through December 30th, which will help our citizens specifically with their December 5th tax bills. And we intend to apply what's referred to as the presumptive clause to our public safety payroll. The presumptive clause is really a new development um, that recently has come out from the federal guidelines that allows us, um, rather than having to specifically track uh, COVID cases to specific employees for public safety and certain other areas such as health and human services, we can apply what's called the presumption clause, which basically means we can assume that the payroll cost for public safety is specifically related to COVID. And they primarily did that because of the administrative burden um, that trying to apply it on a specific employee basis was creating for localities. Right now, our approach is to be pretty conservative in our application of that clause. We know we have lots of other uses, and we've already used a substantial portion of our funding. And as I've outlined, we have some other things in the pipeline. But at this point, we are planning to use uh, the presumptive clause for our sworn officer positions in public safety, specifically fire and police. We would apply that to their salary and also the involuntary taxes, such as FICA. We do not intend to use it for voluntary benefits at this point, um, namely health insurance and dental insurance, although it does appear that CARES would allow that, and we may do that if we need to do that in the future. If we were to do that and apply that presumptive clause, the numbers that I provided tonight for fiscal year 20 would improve because basically we would be able to apply CARES funding to those positions that payroll costs, which at this point has been paid with local dollars. So that may, that may change as we continue to go through the process of closing out our fiscal year. And that concludes my remarks. Turn it back over to Ms. Thank Larson. You. Thank you. And I hate to put you on the spot, but what are you hearing in the finance world about when we might 
see some type of turnaround, it, do you think it's based on when there's a vaccine, or do you think we'll start seeing some, I mean, some states, like North Carolina, I just read that the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse has seen the biggest increase in visitors since they've had in 2003. So there is some traveling going on, and we are a tourism-based county. Um, so there, there are some places where people are traveling, um, but we've not been able to open up Bush Gardens yet. Right. Um, they, they are opening for small groups, we should say, and I think that's been very successful. I don't think King's Dominion's opening at all this year or Water Country. So... Um, what do, you, what do you think? What do you think we might see a turnaround? Well, theories are all over the place on that, and some of, so much of it does depend on the decisions that are made, you know, locally, for example, for school divisions and whether they continue to operate virtually, um, and also how much enforcement, um, at least with the financial community, what we see in the numbers has a lot to do with if people are doing what they should be doing and the level of force enforcement that's going on in the community. Um, most people think that it will get worse before it gets better type situation with the colder weather coming upon us. Um, we did see, at least in the Hampton Roads area, as things started to reopen, our numbers, of course, increased. Um, I think that that was predicted to happen, and we saw that happen. And then as people started um, you know, to enforce some of the measures already in place, the numbers have started to come back down. So there's lots of theories um, behind that. A lot of it specifically in terms of finances, um, is very dependent on how much you rely on that tourism and how much your your budget is tied to people being out and about. Right. Um, there are some localities that aren't impacted very greatly at all, and right. then there's others such as us that have a, a real impact, a very significant impact. Yeah. Uh, we do know that, like you said, our lodging tax is down quite a bit, and so you know we hope that we can start seeing an increase in visitation. I will say that I think people have been pretty good about wearing their mask um, when I'm out and about, and um, I've, I've traveled a little bit as well. I see most people wearing masks, um, respecting social distancing, and, um, and that's just really important, I think, until there is a vaccine, um, because I, we want to be able to live you know, our lives and, and get our economy going if we can, so it's very important to follow the rules. So. Uh, with that, Ms. Larson, uh, before you move on, sure. and I hate to again put uh, Sharon on the spot, no, thank so to you. speak, but uh, you know, a number always interesting to me is the year end number, and I know that's always sort of a she, she's usually very conservative, so I want to make sure her number doesn't get any worse and potentially may get better. So, is that can you respond to that, Sharon, and just help me along? I, I would say that we're far enough long, along now where I'm comfortable saying it, it should not get worse. <laughs> and is there opportunity it might improve as we go through the next Correct. month or two? Correct. And a lot of that will depend on some of the decisions, you know, that are made in terms of the CARES funding and the presumptive clause and, and the level or extent to which we decide to use that. Very good. Thank you. That, that's enough for me. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I'm going to see if Latara has any questions that have come in uh, from people that might be watching or that have emailed. I'm happy to report we have quite a few questions that have come in from people that are watching. Um, just as a reminder, we have invited uh, citizens to send in questions by Facebook Live, or you can send in questions by email to community.meetings at jamescitycountyva.gov. If we're not able to get to your question this evening during this live event, or if you are watching later on um, on demand, you can send questions directly to our Facebook page. Just find James City County on Facebook, or you can send us questions again to that email box, community.meetings at jamescitycountyva.gov. So the first question for the evening, even though the public input period for shaping our shores is over, what if I want to make a suggestion for a feature at a county park? What is the process for that? Well, even though the Shaping Our Shores master plan was adopted and approved, there's always room for adjustments. Um, like I said earlier, the plans are approximately um, in place for 10 years. During that 10-year period, you know, trends come and go, the activities people want to do come and go. So there is definitely always room for um, input from the citizens on things they'd like to see in the parks. Um, 
there's always an opportunity for public input. We have um, opportunities for that th online. The um, county website, there's a public a comment card. Citizens can use that to give us comments um, whenever, they, whenever they have them. They can also directly contact Parks and Recreation staff members through email or phone and, and give their comments or suggestions that way. We always welcome citizen input to help us improve. Thank you. Next question. What is the status of phase one construction at the marina? Last year, this was delayed due to the lack of constructor quotes, con contractor quotes. Will phase one begin this year? And are there floating slash covered boat slips still in the works to re be replaced eventually? Ms. Lawrence, if you don't mind, I'm, okay. I, I, I'm able to respond to that right. question. Um, I will say we, we delayed the project last year. We did bid the project uh, last winter. Uh, it was delayed due to price. Uh, we had a bid and we'd gone through the process. Uh, we felt we could get a better price with more bidders, so we did uh, reject those bid or that bid and have re-bid the project. We have attracted uh, three contractors this time. We're again a bit over budget and we're working on our recommendation to the Board of Supervisors, which I hope they will have in September. Uh, it would include uh, the entryway, the first slips on the right as you go into the marina, all the way down to the public boat ramp. And so it would make the dock improvements, the fuel system, it would move the kayak launch to the other part of uh, the waterway. So you separate the kayaks from the boaters, provide lighting and some other amenities for the community. So that is a project we're working along and trying to figure out, can we make that award this fall? And if that project were to move forward, it would go to construction then October, November, and be finished sometime um, late spring of uh, 2021. In terms of the covered boat slips, there is a phase two to the marina project that would take it basically from um, the boat ramp area and go on around the corner to where the current boat storage is. It would turn into more public parking for boat trailers. Uh, it would replace those covered uh, boat slips uh, with new and add a third set of docks and move the ramp to the end. That project is currently in our capital improvement pr uh, plan, in our five-year plan, and it is scheduled for FY23, so it's still a couple of years away. Uh, I will tell you, just as a, a forewarning to that, uh, I do intend to have some conversations with our Board of Supervisors about our capital improvement plan and the five-year look and the, the cost of the projects, not just at the marina but others, to sort of reprioritize. And so I don't know where that project will fall out, but I know it's still an important project uh, to those or to the community and to the staff and to the users of the marina. It's certainly something that I think we'll talk as we go into the future about the covered boat slips and their possibility. So uh, did I get all our questions in that, Latara? I think that covers that question. <laughs> right. Thank you. We have more. <laughs> Uh, question. The next question is, will the Shaping Our Shores master plan cover plans for Brickyard Landing? Interesting. Um, for those that don't know, um, the county did receive a grant to purchase um, 119 acres um, around the current Brickyard Landing boat ramp. Um, that property purchase was just completed last week. Great um, and so we will be looking to do a master plan for that parcel. Um, unfortunately, the timing is such that we've just completed this master plan, which should be good for 10 years. So I, I would see us doing um, the Brickyard Landing uh, master plan by itself so we can um, determine what kind of changes and amenities we want to put in there in the short term. I think eventually long term you would have all of them under one master plan so all the waterfront parks are together. Okay, thank you. This question came in via email. Will the travel lift and Hampton Marine Service be retained? I believe that Jamestown is the only place to haul a large boat between Newport News and Hopewell. You know, I don't know. Do you have a good response to that, Carl? I at least have an opinion. Maybe Alistair has a better um, thought. He looks like he's going to... We are proposing to keep um, <laughs> marine <laughs> repair in the, um, the new relocated... Um, office that I showed in the master plan. It will have the marine repair still on site. In terms of the, um, the lift that's used to, to move boats in and out, I don't believe it's been used for a couple years. Um, he currently has other equipment that he uses to um, put boats in and out. So I'm not certain on the, the long-term future of that lift. Anything to add, Alice? Very good, I think she covered it for me. Okay. All right. Is there any plan to dredge Powhatan Creek, especially in the way of the parkway bridges? My 28-foot boat will not pass under the bridges except at very low tides, but then the water depth is shallow. 
a discussion. Carla's probably the best person on that, too. That was for dredging where? The Powhatan uh, Creek. Mm -hmm. Probably right by Powhatan. the marina. Powhatan Creek, especially in the way of the parkway bridges. Okay. Um, for the um, the work that's that's going to be done for the marina, that is part of the bid, was for dredging um, the part that is inside the marina basin. Um, so that is part of um, some of the bids that were we've gotten back to look at dredging that area. Um, in terms of dredging out from the marina basin out, that is not um, a parks and recreation project. Um, that dredging of that area is typically not handled by the locality. It's at some national park yeah, service. And, and I will say, just to add to what Carla shared, we have had discussions with our parks and rec director about is there a way and a possibility and how do we help pursue that and push that, but it is a separate from our marina project, so it's something we've heard before from the voting community. It's something of interest to the county, but I do think it's an entity beyond us that would likely do that, and so we continue to have uh, express an outreach and look for opportunities to have that creek uh, dredge so that the larger boats uh, in particular can move back and forth. So. Next question is, when leaving the James City County Marina headed toward the James River, there is a location to the right just near the overpass bridge called Sandy Bay. It is not well marked and the fluctuating depths from the tide changes are causing difficulty for power boaters to successfully navigate their way through the waterway channels, especially, excuse me, even experienced boaters. Currently, there are white poles indicating where the rock hazards are located. When I asked a marina employee about the best way to travel through Sandy Bay, I was told to stay away from the poles and to just stay in the middle. I would like to see James, James City County place markers suggesting the best waterways for navigating through this difficult area. So more of a comment than a question. But. Well, I think if I can at least respond, we have, we have heard that request a number of times over the year, and, and we, we too would like to do all we can to help mark the waterway. The challenge is that's not our business. We are not experts in uh, marine navigation and where uh, the channels move, and they do move. It is an active system, and so we've had some conversations, and if, if we get into the fa uh, stance of putting a marker, which we could, then what happens when that's not accurate and somebody has an accident because we didn't know enough to keep that marker in the right place? And so those are conversations we've had as well with the uh, Coast Guard and trying to, or Corps and trying to have those kinds of things marked uh, by those that do that. Unfortunately, those entities are pulling back and trying not to mark some of these smaller waterways that aren't as navigable. Uh, and so that's an ongoing concern for us. So the white poles at this point is the best advice we have. That has been marked just by some good citizens that knew they were there and put them up. Uh, we did put, a, I guess, a map at the marina, just trying to give you what we know is sort of our best cautionary for getting out into the James. And so we're trying to provide information without putting it out there so it looks overly official and creates a problem in an area that we weren't really uh, maybe able to, to comply with or to provide the right direction. So we'll continue that as an area of concern, uh, but it really isn't a function for the county to do. It's one of those things for us to advocate for, and we'll continue to do that. Okay, the next question is not related to shaping our shores, but um, it's a, I guess it's a school's funding question. Why is there not more school division savings since the students spent March through June in virtual education? You want to take that, Chair? I mean, you've, you have a really, I, I want to commend both the county administrator and Ms. Day on the relationship that they have with WJCC schools, and it is a one of constant communication. Uh, that said, from the Board of Supervisors' perspective, uh, we, we don't run their budget uh, per state code. Uh, I'm, we've been known to offer a suggestion or two along the way, but um, there, there, ha there was some savings that they did turn back over to us, but maybe you could, um, you could talk a little bit about some conversations that you've had with their chief financial officer. That's absolutely correct. I, I don't know the details enough to speak intelligently um, on that question, uh, but I do know, like us, they were very conservative when they first provided um, what their projection for year-end funds would be. 
Um, since that time, it has improved. Um, and again, a lot of that had to do with that sales tax for education figure that I spoke to earlier. Um, I think we were all very conservative in those sales tax figures. And um, much to our surprise, like I said before, the numbers actually came in above budget. So um, I do believe that their year-end projection is, is even better than it was previously. Um, I know that the boards worked together to, um, to find a solution to help offset the shortfalls in fiscal year 21, one of which was um, you know, the schools utilizing some of those funds um, to help their needs in 21. Um, and so they have been a wonderful partner you know, through this process, um, both from that standpoint and just having open lines of communication um, we both help each other with our finances, and um, I think the more people working together, the better, the better we all are. Um, they also worked very hard with us, as I mentioned before, in returning some of their capital projects. Um, they've scrutinized their budgets, and I know as part of that process, they utilized some of their own personnel to do some projects that um, were really scheduled to be done by contractors. And so now whether they did that because they were redeploying some staff as a result of having some staff maybe that was freed up because they were closed, that, that type of thing I can't speak to. Um, but I know that, again, they returned $2.4 million um, to us. They have earmarked $2 million of their surplus from 20 to be util utilized in 21. Um, and I believe that their most recent estimates are somewhere in the 4 to $5 million uh, range in terms of finishing the fiscal year. Um, that's about the extent that I can that I can speak to the details of their budget. Um, but again, it has been a, a wonderful effort um, in, in working together through these challenging times. And I'm sure they've had to re they've had to buy some technology because which may be something they can do through the CARES Act because they're trying to get a device I think in every student's hand uh, since they know they're virtual for at least the first nine weeks. And they also did that towards the end of last school year. Uh, that, that also takes some additional curriculum purchase. You, you can't just take a curriculum that you've had that you can do in person and suddenly get that online. So I'm sure they've had some additional spending as well. Yes, and I know even though they are they are operating in a virtual environment, the teachers are required to actually utilize their classroom at least two days a week. And so they are actually using those facilities. And again, because people are entering those buildings, they have to make sure that the buildings are heated and cooled and cleaned and, and all that good stuff. And so just like the rest of us, they've saved in some areas but had to spend money in other areas that they weren't originally budgeted to do. So it's really more a shifting of resources as opposed necessarily as just um, saving. And again, I do want to share, even though we may be saving on the expense side, we are seeing revenue shortfalls, and the schools experience that as well. They had programs that they charge service fees for that they aren't, they aren't receiving. Um, so again, like us, some of these things go hand in hand, and so where they have the expenditure savings, they don't have the revenue either. I just ask a quick follow-up along those lines about the broadband. So we're working to to get broadband out to more families in James City County and we're doing the, using CARES money to do that. How are, you, how are you deciding where we need to get that broadband to? I, you can't just, I imagine we can't say everyone that doesn't have internet, but. Well, you know, we're, we're working really hard. The CARES Act does provide funding. If we get it in place before December 30th, that where we could provide internet service to unserved homes with students. So it's not unserved homes, it's unheard, it's trying to get that broadband to students. And so we have worked with the school system to get the addresses of their students so we know where students are. We've worked with Cox Communication, who's been a really good partner, but very protective of their information. So Cox won't give us their map and say, here's the streets without service. They will work where we give them address points or say, these are the streets that have students. And then they, they so we've gone back and forth with our staff and their staff a number of times trying to determine where their need is. Fortunately, it appears a very high percentage of James City County residents have access, so that's good. Mm -hmm. If you're one of those few or the lower percentage that doesn't have access, that's still a problem. And we do have 12 projects moving forward with Cox, uh, ranging anywhere from zero, I mean very low cost, meaning cable was very close, or $15,000 to $150,000 that will serve uh, 30 to 40 students, and I, I'm, I'm a number's coming from memory, but it's a significant number of students who are now un unserved that we believe we can have in place by the end of December. And hopefully, 
much before that. I'd love to have some of those services in place in September, October, but we are working with schedules. We've talked with the school system. They're extremely supportive of that. Uh, we do have a lot of mobile um, uh, hotspots out there for students that need internet access. The library has been a good partner at that. The schools are upping it outside of their facilities, and our staff has been working with them as well. But the, the broadband access really is important both for school and other activities within a home. And so I think they will have good progress in the coming months, but it won't be there September when they go back to school in, in uh, the coming weeks. So again, we're working to have it soon, um, but it needs to be as soon as it can be, and we'll get there. It's been a good project and a good effort, um, but by December, I think many will have it. Thanks. Sorry, Latar, I wanted to follow up on that with Fred Klein. Would the nonprofit COVID assistance include organizations such as Community of Faith, of Faith Mission? Yes, there is an exception. Typically, um, local government cannot. That's one of the exceptions in the code. We're not allowed to provide funding to faith-based organizations. There is an exception to that for COVID and CARES funding. I think to follow up, any nonprofit or organization that is providing services to the community related to COVID. If you've had an impact related to COVID, this is an opportunity to at least apply. It's a fairly simple application. So if you're wondering, I would encourage you to go online, James City County, and find the, our application and, and make that application to us and have a conversation with our staff. That'll at least get it to us uh, and we can make a determination on whether you would qualify or not. But if you're providing a service that's uh, impacted by COVID or you're helping uh, those with COVID-related um, issues, then, then I think you would have a very high likelihood of qualifying for funding. Yeah, I had a, an organization reach out to me who had had to go, um, they've had to go digital uh, to, they, they serve um, a population that is like English as a second language. And they were like, but we don't know if, you know, is, is, this, is this what you're, I said, apply, you know. I mean, you are providing, you've had to switch gears because of COVID. And that's what we're trying to do. So, you know, I encourage you to apply. So, All right. Next question is, are we, meaning James City County, taxing at a high enough rate to have the, high, the recommended amount of money to support us through emergency situations? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well... But, you know, I, I think when you talk about taxing at a high enough rate, I, I think um, as a new county administrator coming into a community, I've been here almost two years, we're in really good financial shape. It's not to say the COVID impact's not significant in our budget. It is. Uh, tourism, we've estimated, is a 15 to $19 million annual impact. So when that hurts, our budget hurts. Uh, but we have a good fund balance. We have good policies in place. We have good reserves and other funds. We have a board that has been conservative in budgeting. This year, it would have been easy to balance this year using some fund balance. There was a lot of pressure to do that, to have less impact on the school system. But as a staff and as our board, we didn't feel that was the right direction. To, so we are in good shape. Should this pandemic have a greater impact than we anticipate today, we'll be prepared to meet that need. So again, higher tax rate would generate more revenue, that's always, uh, in terms of financial stability, a, a good thing. But I would tell you, James City County is in a great place. We're triple um, A bond rating by th all three rating agencies. There are not many communities that can say that. So I don't know if Ms. Day has anything to add to that, but I think we're in good shape. We will talk about additional revenues as we get into next year's budget. Uh, but I think today I would tell you we're in a great place. For the emergency and being able to respond, I think we're in good shape. I think you summed it up very, very well. And I'm a big believer. It's not the tax rate. It's really, you know, how responsible you are in your spending. Um, we, we are programmed to have a five-year um, revenue forecast presented to the board this fall sometime. Um, and that'll be a really good um, look into the future and just revenue projection-wise um, fr from that standpoint, but just also what the expenditure drivers are so we can kind of see what's in the pipeline. Um, potentially or specifically related to capital projects. Um, the comment was made earlier, um, we were, we did put a lot of restrictions in place, but by doing that, we just delayed a lot. And when you kick the can down the road, often the cost of that expenditure may go up. Um, and so those things are still gonna probably need to be done. Um, and we expect that our budget requests in the future years will continue to go up. And so again, we, we wanna 
have that in the forefront of our minds now as we're going through these difficult challenges and we're talking about using our fund balance, it's important to look in the future and also see what is in the pipeline so you're making decisions not just today and reacting to an emergency, but also what may be happening in the future. Um, if you do use fund balance, how are you going to restore it? You know, those kinds of things. So um, I think you just have to look at everything and its totality to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, I would just say as a board member, you don't want to necessarily focus all of it on taxes. You want to do exactly as has been said. I know what I expressed during the budget process was just making sure that we were having continuous conversations about what our revenue looked like moving forward. We are very fortunate and we offer a lot of nice amenities in our county and it's a great place to live. I think citizens want to be able to still enjoy those amenities and so our, you know, what is it, what is the cost for being able to do that? Um, we've also, we're trying to arrange a joint meeting with the school system and hear from Jim Regenbald, um, who's a sort of a financial guru for, for the schools and for VACO and BML. And, you know, he's going to talk about revenue and how that supports our school system. And we want to have our state legislators there as well as well because you know I think what this has taught us through COVID is we this is a community that depends a lot on t on tourism and the impact that had on our school budget and when we went down in revenue and so you know we need to talk about that moving forward and um, but there's also what do the schools look like you know we don't know what this coming school year looks like and what's what is that going to mean for what we're going to be expected to contribute moving forward you know I, I watched the last school board meeting and I heard two uh, school board members say you know they don't think schools ever going to look the same well what does that mean from the fight you know that's a discussion we really need to have what's that look like from the financial side then and so I think there's so much moving forward and I and I do think that we will continue to have all of those discussions so, Okay, our last question is, due to our current conditions, more people are taking advantage of boating and kayaking. Is there a plan to provide more up-to-date public boats and kayaks? I didn't know um, kayaks. I guess there's more up-to-dates. There, there has been an uptick in um, personal watercraft use like that. Um, we have... Um, racks that are located at the marina and at Jamestown Beach and some of our other parks where um, citizens can rent them by the month and keep their own personal kayaks and canoes there. Um, and I think for the most part they're, they're filled, if I'm correct, Alistair. Um, and we do have canoes and kayaks that um, citizens can rent at the marina and at the beach and I think at Chickahominy Riverfront Park and also at um, Little Creek Reservoir Park, um, and replacing those as part of our operating our cost. Um, we try to include um, replacing some equipment every year in our budget as we move forward. I'm not certain that it's planned to increase the number necessarily, but we do try to keep our fleet up to date and operational. Great, thank you. I will just also add that we didn't, um, it's not a question, but a request on behalf of dog lovers in James City County. Uh, many area dog owners wish to have a designated dog park with water play, swimming access, or even designated off-leash dog play hours at any of the existing James City County waterfront county parks. Um, is there any, any thoughts moving forward on that? Well, there's currently an off-leash dog park at the Jamestown Beach Event Park. At the front area of that park, you can um, go and exercise your dog there off-leash. That was kind of our, um, our first um, try at a dog park um, experiment, yeah. if you will, to see if that's the type of dog park that citizens wanted versus the, um, the leash kind of um, fenced-in one. So that is available right now. Um, while your dog cannot roam free on the beach, you can take your dog to the beach and take it off the leash to let it swim. So that is an option also. You can swim your dog. Um, we ask that you don't let your dog roam, though, on the beach where the, where the citizens are. Um, there's a plan long term in the um, master plan for Freedom Park for a dog park. Um, funding is not secure for that yet, but that is a long term plan. 
And we're also currently looking at maybe locating um, a future dog park at Veterans Park. Um, that would probably be more of a uh, fenced-in um, each kind. So we, we are looking at our options. A lot of dog lovers here in James City County. That's good. Latara, anything else? Or? Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, this would probably be a good time to um, give some information that we received from Diana Mormon, who is our Director of Elections and our General Registrar. And just because with the um, election coming up in November, uh, she wanted to let our citizens know that there are three methods of voting in the November 3rd general and special election. Uh, one is via mailed absentee ballot. You must submit an application in order to receive a ballot. Your voted ballots can be returned via the U.S. Post Office or in person to the James City County Vote Center. And I'm going, to, I'm going to say this address, but then I'm going to add a caveat at the end. Located at the James City County Recreation Center at 5301 Long Hill Road. I do need to add that the James City County Board of Supervisors will be holding a public hearing to move the Office of the Registrar to that address. Um, and that public hearing is September 1st, 5 p.m. here in um, our government complex, and that's Building F. So, um, but I don't think it's a very controversial, I can't speak about a, a vote prior to it being done, but I, I don't think it's very controversial. We realize that we need more space for this election. So um, the other way is via in-person early voting. Uh, no application is necessary, but an ID is. All registered voters are welcome to vote early anytime from Friday, September 18th to Saturday, October 31st, again, if approved on September 1, at the James City County Vote Center, located at the James City County Recreation Center, and those hours are listed on the county's website, or on Election Day, Tuesday, November 3rd, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. at your assigned polling place. For all information and for explanations of the two constitutional amendments, please visit the county's website at www.jamescitycountyva. Dot gov backslash, backslash excuse me vote sample ballots will be available on or before September 11th make your voice heard and vote and we need to thank uh, Diana and her staff this is uh, this is quite a year for um, and um, for elections and and they um, always work very hard there's always volunteers that come out on election day and vote I would also add if anyone is interested in helping her out um, in that area to please get in touch with um, her and um, let her know that, that you might be available to volunteer. Uh, just a warning, you, you go in, I, I, this is the way it used to be anyway, I think you have to be there at about 5.30 and you stay until the final votes are counted. So, but, but we do need, and, and especially a lot of times our volunteers on election day um, are senior citizens that are retired and, and I think this year there's some concern because some of them may be very vulnerable so we may need um, some additional volunteers. But we're getting ready to um, to finish up but Scott if you, I'd love to see if you'd like to make a few remarks before we do so. Well yes ma'am well thank you. I do want to thank Ms. Larson for pulling us together and hosting our community conversations. You know our staff puts a lot of effort into this as well so I want to thank them. And then I, really this is all about our citizens and our community. And so I want to thank those that have tuned in and those that have submitted questions. I really, a couple of them a little tougher than I'd hoped for, but they're still good questions and we really enjoy that dialogue. And so I would encourage those to, you know, really ask any time if you have questions of us. I, I will tell you I'm excited about the future of our waterfronts, the parks that are laid out by the Shaping Our Shores Master Plan. I think they do provide a good guide. Certainly as we go forward in time, they may look a little different, but they're a good path for us to start on. And I'm really excited about that. I also feel very comfortable about the county's ability to make it through the financial impact that's created by the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, as we said earlier, our board has been conservative in budgeting and our staff have followed this lead very well. Right down to the departmental level, we're talking about finances and making sure we're making the right decisions all the time to take us through this. I still worry an awful lot about our business community. Uh, some are doing well, many are struggling, and certainly we will talk about how do we, we help and, and reach out to us. There are state and federal programs. We did have a business grant program that is still out there 
there for a few more weeks. Uh, but I do worry about our, a lot of our businesses uh, in this community that are so dependent on tourism and still have a long road to go. Uh, as I said earlier, I would uh, encourage anybody with questions to find us, whether these topics or other. We want you to know how your county government works, and, uh, and we'll reach out in whatever way works best for you. If you like to Facebook, we're there. If you want to email, we're there. If you want to call, we're there. And my number for phone calls is 757-253-6603, 253-6603, and I'm available email and other as well. So. Uh, we're all open, always open to suggestions for how to communicate or engage with the community. This is certainly one. It's not quite as nice as having uh, citizens in the audience, but I think it's still a good forum for us to push out, it seems to be, with the questions that we've received. Uh, I would also say I've participated in a couple of virtual meetings with various clubs in the community, and, and while that's interesting with 45 people on the other into the computer watching you or talking to you. I think that's still a way to reach out. So other ideas that our community has uh, before we get back to normal, uh, we certainly are, are willing to, to entertain. And, you know, we, we have social distance here in the room. We all came in with our masks today. I would, and those in the audience with us that are staff members are masked up. So I would just encourage the community to continue doing that. I think we all can do better. Um, masking does seem to make a difference. So I would just encourage mask usage. Whether you like it or not, it seems to make a difference. So please do that. The social distancing is important and then washing or sanitizing our hands and what happens in this region uh, really is dependent upon us if we can pull these numbers down and keep the positivity rate down then our business community has a much better chance and so i think we all have to do our part with that and i would just encourage that but miss larson thank you again for thank you. pulling us together i think yeah. it's been a good hour at least on my side and yes. uh, to those others so I want to thank everyone. I appreciate all of you participating. And um, I also want to thank Chris Williams and Mitchell Anderson, who are behind the scene. Um, they always do such a great job getting us out on um, TV and, and Facebook and everything that they're doing. So th I want to thank you guys. Um, I just uh, appreciate everything that you've said and agree with you um, about it all. I want to thank those that have uh, that are watching and those who have submitted questions. Please do continue to do that. And we're going to continue to look for ways to um, in keep engaged with the community. I did want to uh, give you some idea what I do um, on as part of my Board of Supervisors responsibilities, I serve on the Tourism Council, uh, which is what the, when the historic triangle tax was put into law, uh, the Tourism Council was um, created. I am the treasurer for that organization. That is an open organization. We have been meeting on Zoom, but you can get into those meetings. Um, if you'd like any information on that, please reach out to me. Uh, my number is 757-603-0508. And as I said, my, my email is also on the county website. I serve with Mr. Stevens on the regional jail board. And um, those meetings, I think we, I can help you get those minutes if you're interested in that. I do represent Region 2 on the Virginia Association of Counties. I'm the representative there on that board. And as part of my responsibilities on that board, I serve on the Economic Development uh, Committee and the Education Steering Committee. And I'm also on the recently appointed local government uh, task force. Uh, we have been having uh, bi-monthly uh, phone calls with the governor or people on his staff. Um, those have been discontinued, though, during the special session. So if there's anything on, on any of those that I mentioned that interests you, please reach out and I can try to get you some more information. Um, just going back to one of the points that you brought up about our businesses, I do some of our businesses have been so creative during this time and thank those citizens that are supporting our businesses. I mean, we know some are not gonna make it, very unfortunately. Um, we hope that many, um, that most do. So anything that you can do to support those businesses, um, we, we very much appreciate it. But again, thanks to everybody that, that participated in this. I very much appreciate it. So thank you. <laughs>